When a pastor visited a young family, the five-year-old answered the door. My mommy's taking care of the baby, he said, but she'll be out, be out in a minute. So the pastor tried to make some conversation with the young boy. What do you want to be when you grow up? And the young boy said, I want to be possible. The preacher said, what do you mean by that? Well, almost every day, my mommy calls me impossible. <laughs> possible or impossible, that's the question our scripture raises today. Jesus did the impossible when he took a small lunch of bread and fish and fed 5,000 people. When we wonder what to do with this story, we're asking a Greek question. To the Greeks, the, the question was always scientific. What happened? How did it happen? But John never would have asked that question because Hebrews would ask, what did it mean? I am content to think that Jesus really performed this miracle because, as C.S. Lewis says, a miracle is simply God doing in microcosm what he already does in macrocosm. So, taking the Hebrew approach, what's this story telling us? I'd like to focus on three things. If God can do miracles, will God give me what I want? Can we limit God? And how can God use us? I hear TV preachers promising that if you obey God or support the program, God will make life comfortable for you. Really. I saw a video clip called Me Church that satirically suggests that the church is here to serve you. A young business professional came to the pastor and said, I'm so busy, I wish church would start when I get there. And the pastor said, okay. And then a young father came. He wanted a church where he didn't get looked at and stared when his baby screamed. No problem, said the pastor. If other people are upset, they can leave. And then a frazzled, overworked mother wanted an oil change and a lube while she worshipped. Ah, I think we can figure that out. And then a football fanatic asked for tickets to the Super Bowl in exchange for coming to church. Oh, well. <laughs> the final line of the video is, Me Church, the church where it's all about you. The church is not a Me First establishment. It's not about growing membership. We can't own God. Rob Bell says in the book that These Seekers is, is studying, Love Wins, we can point to God, we can name God, follow God, discuss God, honor God, and believe in God. But we cannot claim him to be ours any more than he is anyone else's. When we get too familiar with God, we tend to ask what God can do for us, and we forget who God really is. The feeding of the 5,000 is noteworthy because it's mentioned in all four Gospels, the only miracle mentioned in all four Gospels. Ever wonder how 5,000 people happened to be in that region of, of the country when Jesus was preaching? Well, the scripture says it was Passover time, so people were traveling on the roads from their towns to Jerusalem. And likely the news of Jesus' miracles spread from traveler to traveler. To escape the crowds, Jesus' disciples pushed off in the boat across the lake so Jesus could get some time alone. But not daunted, the crowds walked 15 to 20 miles all the way around the lake in order to find Jesus. There are four people in this story. First of all, Jesus looks over the crowds and he says, how are we going to feed these people? And then Philip responds, that's impossible. It would take six months wages to feed all these people. 
And then Andrew said, well, let me scope the area. Maybe somebody has a lunch. And he found a small boy with just a fish and some barley loaves. Now, you've got to know that barley loaves were the bread of the poor. The boy had little to offer, but he's willing to share. And you realize that in making this sacrifice, he had no guarantee that he was going to get food in return. Yet his offering, I think, made the miracle possible. I wonder if Jesus would have done the miracle if no one would have shared. Like Philip, we see the problems, not the possibilities. Andrew's assessment of the boy's lunch was, here's a lunch, but what good is that among so many? When we wish for peace in the world, that the hungry would be fed, that the homeless would find housing, we're overwhelmed with the need. We're apt to say, what good can I do in the face of all this poverty and violence? Remember the story of the man who walked along the ocean throwing sand beach sand, starfish into, back into the water? People laughed at him for being foolish. They'll just end up back on the beach, they said. But as the man picked up another starfish and threw it back in the water, he said, it made a difference to that one. Our job is to make a difference. Another famous story you may have heard is Stone Soup, about the stranger who came to town and was hungry, but no one would feed him. And so he told them, I can make a special stew out of stones and water. Well, they were curious, so they got him a big kettle. And as the water heated up, he said, I can smell this already. It's going to be so tasty. But it sure would be a little better if we had some meat to put in it. And so someone went to their storehouse and got some meat. And then he kept stirring it, and he said, Ah, you know, a couple vegetables would really taste good. Can you imagine potatoes and carrots and a little onion? Off they went and got the vegetables. And whenever, when the stew was done, everybody has something to eat. And it was a good meal. The moral is, selfishness limits what can happen. Generosity increases the possibilities. So let's talk about impossibility for a minute. I've got three short examples. In Lewis Carroll's masterpiece, Through the Looking Glass, this is a conversation between Alice and the Queen. I can't believe that, said Alice. There's no use trying. One can't believe impossible things. The Queen responded, I dare say you haven't had very much practice. Why, when I was your age, I practiced be believing the possible for half an hour a day. In fact, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Charles Kettering says, when I was research head of General Motors and wanted a problem solved, I'd place a table outside the meeting room with a sign that said, leave slide rules here. If I didn't do that, I would find someone reaching for his slide roll, and then he would get to his feet and said, sorry, boss, you can't do it. And the third one. In Norton Jester's book, The Phantom Tollbooth, there's a classic line. If we told you then that the, exp the assignment was impossible, you might not have gone. And as you've discovered, so many things are possible just as long as you don't know they're impossible. There's a true story of a plane that was badly damaged in a storm. The captain informed his crew that they might not make it back to the base. And then he said, let's have a prayer. After the prayer, the captain took a risk by crawling out onto the wing to make a repair. There wasn't much he could do, but apparently it was enough, and they got back to shore. A young man came up to the captain after and said, thank you for that prayer. I can't be an atheist anymore. 
the captain did not try to manipulate God. It was just an honest sharing of concern with the one who provides our needs. Like the captain, we have our part to do. God made seeds, but we have to plant them and tend them in order to get trees and fruits and vegetables. God gave us grain, but it has to be ground into flour and mixed with other ingredients and baked before we can get bread. One person said, God created, but left the tending of creation to us. There's a story about Thomas Jefferson and his companions traveling across the country on horseback. They came to a dangerously swollen river and trying to cross, the horses balked and the riders fought for their lives. Seeing the danger, one companion asked Jefferson if he would ferry him across the river. The president agreed. When they were safely on the other side, his companions asked, why did you select the president to do that? The man was shocked. I didn't know he was the president. All I knew is that some of you had no written all over your faces and some had yes. His was a yes face. When Pastor Janet asked me to do a video story about where I saw Jesus on the loose, I had to think hard. I discovered that I'm not very intentional about finding where God is in other people. It doesn't take a sleuth to find these small miracles, just an awareness of God in our everyday experiences. I'm going to end with a long story that uh, comes from Carrie. This past spring, Carrie was told a story by the Indianapolis Star journalist, Matthew Tully. Matthew did a long series of stories printed in the Star on the challenges facing students attending Manual High School in an economic, economically depressed part of Indianapolis. There was one particular bright spot in the school, and that was the music room of the choral director. This director brought fresh breath, excitement, energy, and optimism to his students. After a rehearsal for a Christmas program, Matt spoke with the director about the concert. The director said they'd be lucky to get 50 people in attendance for the concert, which was going to be held in an auditorium that seated 1,000 people. One evening on his way home from work, Matt had an idea. He wrote an article for the Star saying to his readers, many of you following the series of, on education have asked me what you can do to help. Matt told them to come out and support these high school students the choir by attending their free Christmas concert. The evening of the concert, Matt arrived early at the school. The choir director appreciated Matt's support and he said, even if only a hundred people come, that'll be twice as many as came last year. As curtain time approached, people started to arrive. Many people Matt was concerned that his photographer had not yet arrived and he didn't want to start without pictures to go with his article. He called his photographer who said, I'm almost there but I'm tied up in traffic. Matt said, there's never any traffic in this part of Indianapolis. So he went to the door to look and all he could see as far as he could see were lines and lines of, of car lights, headlights. Well, the concert was packed out and they had to do a second performance to accommodate everyone who came. The choir raised over $13,000 that night. Matt's follow-up article in the Indianapolis Star caught the eye of one of his colleagues in New York City. Subsequently, the Manual High School Choir was invited to participate in a young people's performance series at Carnegie Hall. 
in New York City. When Matt found out about this honor, he called the director to congrat congratulate him. And the director thanked Matt, agreeing that it was an honor to be invited. But he said, the choir won't be going because in order to get all of these kids to New York City, it would cost more than $30,000. They obviously didn't have that kind of money. Matt went to work again and wrote a third article for the choir. The Indianapolis Star's readers responded with contributions over $100,000. Andrew said, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to all those who were seated, and also the fish, as much as they wanted. A Bible story and a journal article both produced a miracle that many would say, that's impossible. <laughs>